Well, good morning, everyone, or good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong and Zebrium. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning, and we've got an exciting presentation for you. Um, first, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. Today's session is being recorded, so if you miss any of our discussion or you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session. If you have any questions, we encourage you to send those in to us using the Q&A tab, which can be found on the right side of your screen. That's also where you're going to find the chat tab, where we want you to talk with your fellow audience members or just let us know your thoughts or maybe where you're tuning in from. If you navigate to our handouts panel, you'll find a couple of links there that should help you out with today's webinar. We've got a free trial and, and a two minute demo to help out. And before we close, we will also be giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to stick around until the very end. So our topic is automating the observer lessons from 1000 plus incidents. And I'm joined by Larry Lancaster, founder and CTO at Zebrium and Gavin Cohen, VP of product at Zebrium. Larry, Gavin, thank you both so much for being here with me. Larry, you wanna go ahead and get us kicked off? Yeah, thanks, Cody. <clears throat> uh, hopefully you can see my presentation here. So, uh, hey guys, so, so I'm Larry Lancaster, founder of Zebrium. I'm excited to have a chance to talk to you today. Um, this is my favorite topic, which is uh, well, I call, I'm calling my title, uh, my talk, don't call it ML, but my favorite topic is automating the observer uh, lessons from a thousand incidents. So it's an interesting story. I say don't call it ML because it, you know, when you talk to practitioners um, say, and they say, Hey, what do you do? You say, Oh yeah. You know, we do uh, kind of observability or software. You know, we try to automate uh, some part of the root cause process and all that. Uh, they'll say, oh, wow, that's great. And then as soon as you say any of the terms like ML, AI, or machine learning, everyone kind of goes, oh, boy, here we go again. It's going to be another one of those, uh, you know, snake oil kind of things. So so we're going to see if I can I can make the challenge, the Larry challenges. I'm not going to say ML, AI, or machine learning at all for the rest of the talk. So let's see if I can, if I can do that. Um, okay, so to set the stage a little bit, here's the problem that, you know, really motivates what we're doing at Zebrium, right? So I'm sure all of you uh, that are listening uh, spend some time on dashboards. Um, and, uh, you know, generally speaking, if there's a problem, you'll be able to tell from your, from your dashboard, you know, pretty straightforwardly. Um, now, you know, different companies kind of different, you know, they'll have different approaches in terms of once they've done that, if it's not a known issue, how do they troubleshoot? And some people have, you know, dedicated sort of troubleshooting dashboards and some people use other other tools. But for now, I'm just talking about, you know, the typical dashboard, the, the top level monitoring dashboard. You look at it, you know, there's a problem. And the question is, now what? And and the problem here for me the, that, I, that I want to avoid, what I really want to avoid when I have this situation is, having to fall through to digging through log files. Um, I absolutely hate it. Um, and I think what we've found is that's a universal dis distaste, um, digging through log files. And I think a big part of the reason for that is that it's, a, it's an indeterminate process, right? You, you start digging through log files, but you don't know what to search for. If it's a new issue, you just don't know what to look for. So you don't know how long it's gonna take. And what we found is that in, inter in, in industry, it could take anywhere from, you know, half an hour uh, and up to, you know, many hours, uh, even uh, in some cases longer than a day for people to piece together, uh, you know, particularly nasty, extraordinary instance from pieces of log files. So um, Zebrium's mission is, is to kind of come in and say, look, it, you should never have to do that again. Uh, you know, and, and so I'm going to, I'm going to help, I'm going to try to convince you, uh, that, that it's possible, uh, that you may never have to dig in log files, uh, for root cause again. Um, so here's the concept. So we're looking at our dashboard, you, you know, you, this is particular one is Kibana, 
but you know you may have uh, others and you know zebrium integrates with with all the different you know kind of ma major dashboard players but regardless the concept is this you saw those graphs there was some big dip in traffic there was a dip in cpu dip in network uh in uh in uh network traffic and then if you put the zebrium uh, widget on your dashboard, you should see when there's a when you see an um, an incident happening up above, you should see a little red blip. That's the concept. You click that, and it gives you a report. And what's going to do is it's going to go into the log file. It's going to get everything that you were going to have to go search for, and just put it in front of you. That's all it's going to do. But in our opinion, that's that's a lot. So. Um, Kind of set the stage on, on digging in logs. So, so clearly everyone hates that, but um, it, it's true that known issues can often be our seed from, from other kinds of data. Um, but what we found for new incidents, the kind where it's an unknown incident um, is a couple of things. First of all, people having to confront unknown issues is becoming more common because people push to production more, more frequently than they used to. And so that means to some degree, you're always going to be hitting, you know, some steady stream of new issues. You know, some of those are going to be easy. Um, it's the ones that are really nasty that, that we're worried about. So I like to inc include this uh, quote from one of the founders of Epsigon. They're a tracing company that got bought by Cisco, but it was this quote that I really like, which is that, you know, generally speaking, he said, um, you know, uh, metrics are going to tell me when. Tracing is going to tell me where and logs are going to tell me why for a new issue. Um, and, and I tend to agree with that. I think, you know, logs are unfortunately going to be the best place to look uh, to root cause a new issue. And so uh, generically speaking, and so that's why we started with logs. So let's talk a little bit more about the scale of the problem. So 20 years ago, um, you know, you, you might have, you know, you'd have monolithic software. It would usually be delivered on um, on premises. Um, you'd have a user or a few users maybe that are getting impacted by an incident. Um, you, maybe you have 10 log files. Usually it's more like one or two to look through for from a support ticket. And, you know, you can kind of line them up and, you know, you're, you're, you're an expert in that product and, and it, it, it has releases once a year. So, you know, most of the issues are fairly well known um, after a while. And so hunt and search tends to work. Today, it's a completely different beast. You know, you're, you're seeing one incident, you know, the first time an incident occurs, it can take out tens of thousands of users. Um, in addition to that, typically you're going to have, you know, dozens of services, um, each emitting their own log streams, um, each instance of which is emitting. So like, you know, if I've, if I've got a 10 node cluster, you know, I, I might have, you know, a container serving the same service on every one of those um, for every service. And then in addition to that, if I go into the host, there's going to be stuff going into var log, whatever, that isn't getting logged into containers. So you've got just tons of log streams um, to kind of sift through and try to localize, okay, where do I need to look for root cause? Unfortunately, we're still doing the sort of hunt and search thing. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm going to try to convince you we don't have to do forever. So now let's talk a little bit about what's good about logs, though, because, you know, it's easy to get lost in the negative. Um, one thing that's great about logs um, to me is that typically they're, I mean, they're uniquely encoded for human troubleshooting. That was their origin. Um, and today, I think in general, they still are. Oftentimes, there will be just kind of, you know, human readable sentences. You could practically, you know, read it like you would read a story or a novel or something, right, as you read your way through a log file. Um, they have unlimited dimensionality. You know, a developer can emit as many kinds of events as he wants. Uh, he, he can put, you know, as many parameters in it as he wants, um, you know, and you may, in some ways that's a bad thing, but in, in many ways, it's a good thing for, for debugging. If you have that in front of you, uh, the possibilities for, for getting information through are endless. So given that it seemed appropriate to, um, kind of look at the problem of trying to automate that root, root cause flow from logs by starting and thinking about how do people do it, right? If it was built for people in the first place, maybe that's where we should start. And so 
so that has that has been our approach. And so I'm going to kind of walk you through that kind of what we found people do when they're doing debugging, uh, or I should say troubleshooting through logs, not debugging, troubleshooting in production. Um, and and then we're going to kind of walk through that and then explain how we've kind of automated those steps, right? So the first step, obviously, is detecting that you have a problem. Um, you know, there could be stuff in the logs and errors and stack traces, or there could be tickets. Uh, if it's, you know, depending if it's a like it's a IT environment, there will be service tickets, uh, whatever. I'm not going to dwell too much here. Um, the point is somehow you're going to know that there's a problem. You may have met metric alerting set up, for example. But really what's interesting to us is what happens once you know that there's a problem and you, and, and you know that you don't know what it is. So what we found about um, about humans uh, root causing in log files is that um, there's a couple things that they're going to notice. Um, and, and I'm going to start with this, and it's the most interesting, which is they're going to have a sense of what's unusual. Um, and and they, they may express that in different ways. They may say, you know, oh, you know, I... The last time I saw this was when there was this other problem, or I've never seen this before, or that happens all the time. And what you find um, is that as people become expert in a stack, this is kind of the primary meat of what it is that they're learning. Like they become familiar with the, the sort of general behavior of a stack. And, and that goes for the log files as well. Someone who's become an expert in uh, troubleshooting through through logs of a particular stack, they just know this stuff by heart. Oh, I, you know, that's unusual or that's that happens all the time. That that's um, harmless. So this sort of stuff, right? And so really, the question is, how can we how can we get kind of that knowledge, uh, you know, without bringing on you know an expert or having an expert sit and try to meticulously you know painstakingly train our software right um, so that really was kind of where we've brought technology to bear um, so how right so so another way that humans will tend to find the, the root cause indicators is that they're going to notice that there's these rare events that are happening um, and that those are happening abnormally close in time to errors. Okay. Um, so, so it, it may be that, you know, you, you see some rare stuff happen, maybe it's a configuration and then all of a sudden, you know, downstream or in some other service, there's a problem and that problem starts up and it's, you know, it includes some amount of badness It includes some errors. Um, and, and again, a lot of this is going to be you know, stack dependent, stream dependent, just because I have errors doesn't mean that there's a problem. In fact, a lot of stacks you'll get involved in and you'll say, oh, you know, I keep seeing this error over here. And someone will say, oh, you know, that happens all the time. Um, but in any case, what you will tend to see um, during an incident we found is you'll have some unusual activity in the logs uh, and it'll be in some proximity to errors. And if it isn't, then, um, you know, from, from our perspective, we're going to need some signal that there is a problem. So you would actually, there's integrations you can do to say, oh yeah, I know at this time, you know, there, there was a problem. Um, so in the case that there's logs that, that aren't expressing errors, um, that's, that's one way you have to do with it. Cause you, you need some way to say, here's where I want to start looking. Right. So, so let me put a little more color on this, um, rareness. And I want to talk a little bit about kind of, I think, why ML has got a bad rap, especially in uh, kind of log anomaly detection. So typically what you'll see in sort of log AD products um, will be, um, and there are different approaches. I don't want to point paint with too broad of a brush, but in terms of um, figuring out what events are rare, um, the approaches you see are generally um, a, um, sort of accomplished using some variation of LCS, which is an algorithm called uh, longest common substring. And what it'll do is it'll look for these kind of, you know, constant parts of messages and notice that there's a bunch of those. So if you look in a log file and you see this, like what I have here on screen, um, you'll notice that, you know, in, in each of these lines, <clears throat> I have the phrase widgets processed, period. And so LCS would say, oh, 
you know, you have, there's like 200 of these and they all have this substring. And so I'm going to say, you know, that those are, you know, that, that, that those are kind of a, a feature of an event type. Um, and it'll try to bucket things by these substrings that are in them. And it's actually um, a great, it was a great step forward when it was, um, you know, first applied to logs. Um, one of the challenges is that um, it, it doesn't do very good at all for events you haven't seen many, many times. So it'll do a great job structuring all these, you know, understanding the structure of all these event types that are happening all day long and nobody cares. But what's really important is that you have a sense of, you know, when there's a new, when there's a rare event, how rare is it? And not just globally, but, you know, on this container or on this host, you know, how long has it been since it happened? And to do that, you need some sense of what type of event it is. And unfortunately, most of that just falls in an, into the other bucket. So you end up with these really long training times trying to, you know, get a sense of what is the event catalog for this stack. And it's just, it's unworkable, right? You need something where the first time something happens or the fifth time something happens or the second time, you know that, you know that it's, uh, it's rare uh, and you can act accordingly. So, um, you know, one of the big kind of challenges with determining rareness is this dealing with events that you don't see very often. And that I'd say that's 95% of what, what, you know, sort of the hard problems that we've had to solve. Um, we kind of focused on solving from the beginning. Um, what you'll notice here is in this example, there's like these four that keep happening and they're well-structured, but then in the middle, you've got this thing that happens once and it's like, uh-oh. And so we, <laughs> we don't want that going into the other bucket, right? And then finally, now that you've got these sort of rare things and bad things, um, you're going to construct a narrative. So you're going to gather those events together. Um, and usually people just use like notepad or VI and they'll put, put all these logs they found into a file and then, and then they make a report out of it then by saying, okay, this happened, then this happened. And these are generally, you know, kind of related and so on and so forth. And they'll try to piece together the narrative. <clears throat> so, so we kind of felt like, okay, what we need to do is, you know, find the bad stuff find the rare stuff, um, construct a report with all of the, the pieces that seem to be related to each other. And I'm about to talk about related um, and then put it in front of the operator so that you don't have to go do it. So, so when we talk a little bit about um, related, um, that's interesting because what will happen is <clears throat> in any stack, you'll have rare stuff happening all the time, just by chance. It's happening all the time. And I think this has been kind of another stumbling block in in other um, attempts to bring ML value to market is um, you end up with lots of anomalies. Um, and so either you, you have a choice, either you either you just show these piles of anomalous events with no context and you ask people to go through and rate them and check them off and look at them all. And people really just they they wouldn't do not have the patience for that. They'd rather just go dig through logs um, themselves. Um, the alternative is you don't show a lot of anomalies and you risk, you, you risk not showing something important. So um, what, what, what we thought was important was to do what people do, which is, you know, if I see a rare event and it's, you know, five minutes, say, before there's a problem um, and I'm root causing that problem, I'm probably going to really be really interested in that event, right? If it was two days ago or six hours after, I'm going to be less interested. If it was two days ago, yes, there's situations where you're not going to see anything happen for two days, but that'll be further down my list of things to look at. Um, uh, so, you know, looking at the temporal locality, um, the notion is this, can we look at the activity on these different streams of logs so let's say let's say that there's nothing broken. So you install Zebrium, we're looking, and we see anomalies happening every so often, just like they will by chance. Uh, and we get a sense of, you know, every time there's an anomaly on stream A, how often till there's an error or an anomaly on stream B uh, and, and vice versa. And I do that for every pair of generators. And I kind of develop this, I estimate the parameters of this distribution of kind of inter-anomaly time. Um, and and what will happen is um, when something breaks, what we find is that 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 distribution changes very quickly. You'll have 
clusters in time of anomalies that are happening closer in time on different streams than they normally would. Um, and, and so what's interesting about that is, um, uh, you know, for one given stack, what's close in time may not be close in time for another. You know, if I'm, some systems log so quickly and are, and are logging so much that, you know, a microsecond is, you know, is close in time. Whereas in others, maybe five minutes is close in time. You know, it's not logging much, not doing much most of the time. So, so you kind of have to um, estimate those distributions by just by watching the system work. Um, and then you get a sense of, okay, you know, now I can tell when there's a cluster in time of anomalies, right? So that's really kind of part of the learning you have to do. You have to do that correlation. That's a correlation analysis to then say, okay, I have a cluster of correlated anomalies and errors. Uh, I'm going to create a report out of it and put it in front of the operator. Right? So as, as kind of a, the simplest possible example that was, that actually happened in the real world, um, I put together um, an, a brain dead one. So you kind of get, um, the idea of this concept of clustering uh, errors and anomalies, okay? So like if you look here, so this is um, running the Elastian stack on-prem. Um, they're in the JIRA log. There's, you know, this gets logged by the, by the Postgres driver. It's basically, you know, saying, hey, you know, there was, there was some, you know, fatal error. And it actually tells you in this case that it was, you know, due to an, an administrator command, it's not telling you what command. It's not telling you if the you know administrator type tried to do something, uh, you know that that wouldn't have shut down the database, but then there was an error that did shut it down. Um, so in any case, you know it does. It at least this is like actually probably the best possible error you could get because it does kind of give you the root cause. But now I'm going to show you what happens when you don't get the root cause from the error that you're interested in. Uh, if we merge all the lines from that stack and we and then we kind of scroll up 191 lines in between, you know, just before that that error, there was an entry in syslog um, that that says that uh, the administrator stopped Postgres uh, RDBMS. And in fact, syslog here isn't logging with severities at all. It's not an error. It's just a rare thing. So in in this case, what you can see very clearly is that you have an error and then you have related anomalies happening around it in time. Um, and oftentimes you'll put to, you can put together a stunning narrative of you know dozens of events that can span hours that really tell a story about what happened. The stuff that we've seen in the real world here um, is just it's just fascinating. Um, but then you might be asking, well, Okay, that's great. That's a great anecdote. But how often does that kind of an approach actually give you the root cause in the real world? So here, instead of me blathering about it, I'm going to share a third party uh, two month study that Cisco did before they became uh, our largest customer. So what what they did was <clears throat> they were really interested in this concept. Um, so what they did was they they. Uh, got their senior escalation engineers together. They put together 192 incidents across four product lines uh, that had taken hours to, uh, to troubleshoot, but also where they knew that the uh, root cause indicators were in the log file. Okay. Uh, and they said, okay, here's what we do. We're going to run these data sets through Zebrium. Uh, and then we're going to see what Zebrium would have done with them in real time. Um, and so, so what happened was, um, right. So, so what happened was, uh, in more than 95% of the cases that they checked, um, we found the correct root cause indicators from the log and created a report with them at the right time autonomously without any operator doing anything at all, except putting the logs in. Um, so that's the kind of effectiveness that you can get in the real world just by looking at <clears throat> what's rare, what's bad, finding times where those are correlated together and creating a report out of them. Um, now, uh, in general, 95% is greater than 95% is great. I tell people that what we typically see when you look across a broad, our entire kind of broad swath of users 
um, is is definitely better than 90 percent. Um, I try to caution people against 95 percent. You know, there's a little bit of data dependence here and I don't want to kind of overpromise, but it's 90 percent is actually easily our sort of median across the entire our entire user base. So it's just it's been phenomenal um, how this simple approach, which I can explain to you, it's it's statistical and heuristic in nature, um, has been able to um, you know pull together root cause out of log files. So now what I'm going to do uh, to put some meat on the bone is I'm, I'm uh, well normally at this point in my presentation I show some slides where I show a sock shop and litmus uh, uh, chaos test experiment and some results and how that works. But with us today we have, we have Gavin Cohen from Zebrium as well, uh, who's going to um, actually walk through that demo uh, live for us. Hey Gavin, you there? Hey, thanks, Larry. I'm going to share my screen and. Someone can just hopefully that's working. Okay. Okay. So 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 Larry kind of alluded to to showing a, a live demo of what it really looks like. So if you think back to one of Larry's very first slides, you saw a picture like this. This is actually in Datadog. I think Larry probably showed you that picture in Elastic or perhaps it was New Relic or Profana or whatever it might be, but just let's stick with Datadog. So clearly here, there's, there's some kind of an outage, right? This is a Kubernetes dashboard monitoring an EKS cluster. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you customer data here. So we actually love using um, chaos engineering tools to break applications. And um, one of the sort of nice ones to, to play around with, if anyone hasn't seen it before, there's a really nice um, microservices demo app called Sock Shop. There's actually another one called Boutique as well, but um, it, it's kind of nice. It runs, you know, it's easy to spin up in a Kubernetes cluster. I think it has 15 services, you know, orders and currency and checkout and front end, you know, all the different components you'd expect. It's got lots of, um, you know, some of the pods there are multiple instances of. It's got a load generator, so you can keep it quite busy and it, it, it you know, kind of a, a cool, pretty real life app. And then, of course, we want to be able to break it and see if, if our software, which is built around those heuristics Larry talked about, can pick up the root cause. So what you see here is our nothing to do with Zebrium. This is just a data dog Kubernetes dashboard, but we've added our little widget at the bottom. So there's a Zebrium widget that sits on the dashboard. And what you'll see is really beautifully lined up with, um, you know, if you look at that, that reticle just where my cursor is now, um, lined up with just before everything went south in all those, those metrics charts, we see that Zebrium has a detection. And, and our version of the detection is our, and I'll use the, the word Larry said not to, our machine learning has picked up this, this, this set of patterns in the logs that follow those heuristics that Larry set. What Larry was talking about. So we picked it up at this point, and now I click on it, and what you see here are kind of something interesting. But before I say anything more, um, I'm wondering if any of you can figure out what the root cause is. And it's kind of staring you in the face in, in bright yellow pod network corruption. Okay, so I said this is an online shopping app. I ran a chaos experiment. The actual experiment I ran was called pod network corruption. Um, we're, sit, we're picking that up and, and sending it back to, to Datadog. That sounds like magic, but, but let me dive in a bit further. I'll say something really important, though, first. We don't have any rules whatsoever in place here. In fact, this environment, I said it was an EKS Kubernetes cluster um, running the Sock Shop app. It was running for about two hours prior to me breaking it. So the entire process was new Kubernetes cluster, install Sock Shop, install the Zebrium log collector, Fluent D in this case, to send logs to Zebrium. Let it sit there for about two hours, just generating, you know, log traffic with the load generator running. So I'd had two hours of unsupervised learning, and then I ran the chaos experiment. So let's look at the report now. So now we're moving away from Datadog into Zebrium. And what you see is really that the core of what our system does is 
out of the million or more log lines that flew by in those few minutes that the experiment was running, we picked out 46 events. You see it here where my mouse is, 46 events. And what's more, they come from a bunch of different log generators or log streams or services. So you can see events, chaos runner, messages, you know, pod network orders, etc. Chaos. So there's seven or eight of those. We picked out 46 events out of the, the million. So kind of the needle in the haystack. We do two forms of summarization that aren't the log lines. These are the 46 log lines. And I'll make the, the font bigger for you in a moment when we, we look at the log lines. But on the left hand side, in fact, let me make it a little bit bigger for everyone to see. So the first form of summarization we do is we use some um, GPT-3 to try and give us sort of an NLP summary. And it comes up with a pretty interesting sentence. In this case, the chaos monkey was trying to create an order. Remember, it's an online shopping app. Um, that's not a perfect description of the problem and root cause, but it certainly gives you a sense of, you know, online shopping app and, and you know, a chaos tool. What's more interesting is our software not just picks out those 46 log lines, it tries to pick out words that are kind of associated with those rareness and badness indicators that it thinks might explain the problem. Of course, it doesn't really understand what's going on, but it's pretty uncanny how accurate that is. I mean, we picked up pod network corruption, experiment, you know, exception. This one I'll come back to in a moment. TXQ lens is really cool. But now, and, I, and I, sorry, it's scrolling so much, but I'm just trying to make the font bigger. So on the right hand side are the 46 events. And if I kind of go through what they look like, it, it's, it's really this beautiful story, this dialogue of exactly what happened. So here you see the chaos runner or the chaos engine being initialized and kicking off. So that's the orchestrator for chaos. Then a couple of lines later, we see the chaos experiment kicking off. In fact, this line here is where the experiment kicks off. This is the second column I should point out is the log stream it's picked from. So you can see it's, it's flipping around a bit, but here we picked out um, the fact that we're running a pod network corruption experiment. So, you know, a lot of cynical people say, yeah, sure, you could easily spot that. You know, you just have to look at, you know, some Kubernetes events or you could have a rule when a new pod kicks in or whatever. So that's that's easy. That's not what we're trying to show. What's really cool, well, first of all, none of these are actually errors or anything. They're mostly just debug and, and info. But what's really, really cool is very soon after, if you look at the, the timestamps of 44 seconds, 205 um, milliseconds, just a little bit later, okay, in this message, messages we picked up. So seven seconds later, we pick up this kernel message logged to, you know, messages on the host. So again, not an error saying, you know, the, the Q length misconfig on ETH zero. This is like the, the, the real smoking gun. I mean, the fact that we ran a chaos experiment is the real root cause, but what did it do? It screwed with, with um, ETH zero network settings and the kernel even picked it up. So that's kind of, you know, up till now we've seen the root cause. Then you go just a little bit further and remember there's million, you know, sort of log lines separating all of these. We just happened to have picked out the, the 46 events. We see orders. So now we're seeing the symptoms and these are errors. Okay, these would have been what you would have searched for if you did an error search and, and you were thorough enough. So we see the order service gets uh, an unable to create order due to timeout. We see front end get a 500 error. Um, we see carts getting a you know, socket exception. So these are kind of the symptoms. Obviously, the, the network's all messed up and traffic isn't getting through. So yet the system falls over. Now, we're not trying to say this is you know, a real incident that happened at a customer but it's about as close to, to what a real thing would happen as, as you can imagine. And you saw what Larry said um, with the, the Cisco validation that was performed. They actually took 192 real life incidents and, and played the logs through us and, and we built equally as compelling root cause reports. So I'm now back in Datadog. Um, the notion here is you probably look at dashboards already you probably have rules when you know, you know, you, you might have like a, a metrics rule that says if, um, you know, network rate drops below whatever threshold, 
you know, send in a rule, wake up a pager. The cool thing is you can go to your dashboard or you can go into your incident and you see, well, yep, the Zebrium's got a nice detection just around that time. Click on it to see the root cause. And then this is what it looks like in Elastic. So here's our detection. Here's a little summary of the, the root cause. That's some um, new relic and, and so on. Um, we, we have a Grafana plugin. This is just the, what the plugin looks like. There's our detection. Um, and a bunch of others, you know, Dynatrace, ScienceLogic, um, and a few others as well as the incident management tools. So I'm going to stop sharing and, of course, keep any questions um, coming in, in the chat and we'll either, we'll, we'll cover them at the end and um, hand back to, to Larry. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm just going to wrap up here with my presentation. Okay. Okay. So what have we learned from this exercise? Um, uh, as a company, you know, we, we started with a hypothesis, built technology, took it out. We've had it tested now in the real world, battle tested. So as it turns out, and this is just something you can take away with you. Um, the vast majority of log measurable incidents uh, can be diagnosed from clusters of rare events uh, near clusters of badness, be it errors or signals from other tools. Um, really, the hard part is telling what what is rare and what isn't. Um, and that's kind of where we've spent most of our time from a technical perspective. So um, listen, keep in touch. If you're interested, you should just come by, uh, do a free trial. If you don't believe the 90% figure, try it yourself. You got a, you got a free trial. You can, you can give take it for a spin. The quickest way to become a Zebrium customer is to hook it up and break something, uh, and, and then you'll be sold. Um, also, I have a link here. It's off our website to the Cisco validation. Uh, if you wanted to check out that report, I saw a question on that uh, in the chat. And here you can see uh, my LinkedIn and Twitter handle, as well as uh, my email and Gavin's email. Um, so that's it. Thanks. All right, so Larry and Gavin, we did get a couple of questions throughout today's program, so let's take them from the top. Um, so, the, oh, and yes, we did get a question about that Cisco report being available to read. It is also available in the handouts tab, so if you just want to click over there, you'll see it there. Oh, uh, cool. Um, so from the top, how is your solution different from log anomaly detection in Elastic Stack and others? Um. You know, I kind of touched on this uh, during the talk, um, but, you know, I, I, th I think there's a different focus. So for Zebrium, the focus is on let's create a report. Let's keep it as sparse as possible. So high information content, uh, high information density in that report. Um, and let's not have you kind of look at lists of anomalies and try to gauge them independently. Um, and so... With that different focus, you get a different a different set of results. Um, you know, there. Here's an example where I think um, you know some other approaches might be awesome. Like if what I want to do is I want to find stuff that happens frequently that I'm going to then, you know, parse out and make spreadsheets out of, right? Because someone's logging something with a, you know, a bunch of numbers in it that I want to go, you know, do analytics with or something like that. You could totally imagine, um, you know typical structuring approaches would be really awesome. Um, but that's not what we're, what we're trying to do. So, yeah. Um, so can you give some examples of customers that are currently using Zebrium? Yeah. So, well, so I mentioned, uh, Cisco, right? Uh, so, so they're onboarding, I don't know how many products right now, I think it's over, for somewhere bef between four and eight, and then they've they're going to keep onboarding more products uh, uh, there. But you know, here's one. Actually, let me tell you my favorite. So this is my favorite customer story because at the time it was our biggest customer um, when we when we when we landed them. Um, but it was also our fastest um, kind of uh, close. Like 
someone comes in the door doesn't know anything about zebra to their to their ready to pay um and that was seagate and so so those you may know seagate as the hard drive manufacturer historically um but now they also they also run a um a SaaS service that it's kind of like an s3 uh competitor um and uh, you may know like um, so zoom as an example uses them as a backing store for uh for objects backing object store we'll use the it's called seagate live cloud so it's a pretty big service they have multiple geos uh, big clusters um it's so what was interesting was they so they were bringing this new service online they were running in uh in alpha at the time so there were no customer expectations no user expectations on uptime um uh, thank God, because what happened was um, they had an outage. And when I say an outage, I mean, it was it was a bad one. It went on for hours and hours. And so if it had been production time later, um, they would have been in a world of hurt. It took them a long time to debug because uh, they had to, they had to end up in log files for this. It was a new issue um, and it was very complex. So what they did was um, they this had caused them so much pain. They went in and set up a staging environment, reproduced the exact problem they had, brought in a bunch of tools, trying to see if it would help them to troubleshoot. They brought in Zebrium. Uh, they reproduced the issue. We created a report at the right time with the root cause in it immediately, autonomously, with no training, no rules. And that was it. It was like, great. How do we sign up? That, so that, they're our second biggest customer right now. And then there's there's a ton of en enterprises right now making their way through POCs. Um, and then there's also, you know, a bunch of kind of smaller folks that just kind of come in. We don't have a sales department. It's just people find us. They they use us. They love us. They buy us. Yeah. And I'm just going to tell you a little fun one as well. Um, one of the observability vendors was, um, you know, trialing us as part of the, the integration that we did. And, and it was really cool because... He, the, the, the guy who was an SRE who ran their internal environment had hooked us up to one of their production systems. And we had a call scheduled for the following week, just kind of as a touch base review. And, um, you know, I got on the call with him the following week and he just like was really apologetic and said, look, I'm sorry, I haven't actually had a chance to look at Zebrium at all the last week. I've been dealing with all kinds of crap going on here. We had a, you know, a spun up a new environment and it, it, it was just, failing the whole time and it's just been a nightmare and I said to him hey like you've got that was the environment you hooked Zebrium up to did, did you take a look and he's like well oh, no I forgot so we went in together and you know he shared his screen and right there staring you know us both in the face um, like a minute after he brought up the red web browser on the three or four days before when you know the problem had occurred there was this beautiful event it was some subtle um, you know, Kubernetes resource problem that he hadn't found through every other monitoring and, and tool and hunting. And it was it was right there. So it was really cool. And it's because some of these logs are ephemeral and they're just really hard to to see. And, and you know, we, we picked it up beautifully. So the, the tech really, you know, you probably hear our excitement. It, it really does work. So how do you deal with false positives? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and you know, it's an interesting topic too, because for different people, um, you know, one man's noise is another man's quiet, right? But I can give you a sense for that. So like if you hook up Zebrium, um, you know, typically like the first day while we're still kind of estimating parameters and stuff, it'll be noisier than usual. After the first day or two, um, it's it kind of settles down. And what we typical, typically see is for every report that someone would care about, there's three or four that, that they don't. I mean, as an example, maybe, you know, yeah, it's a new cron job that somebody scheduled. And yeah, there's some error, you know, it's trying to do something with cups or whatever, but nobody cares. It's not, <laughs> it's not going to bring down any services. It's not the end of the world. Nobody wants to be paged on that. So what you don't do is bring in Zebrim and hook it up to a pager based on the auto detected stuff. Right. Um, so what will happen is, you know, of course, you know, you can, you go through those when you see when, when there's a problem, you go and you look, that's really the idea. And that's why our focus is laser on, 
are, we have a laser focus on root cause. So there's detection and then there's root cause. And so when we talk about root cause, that's why we talk about it. Cause um, you know, we want you to do your detection some other way or else it's the middle of the day and you don't mind looking. That's fine. I mean, you can go look at the stuff we find. Um, we do often find things that aren't found in other ways, um, but those aren't usually the catastrophic things. When there's something catastrophic, you're going to know it somehow, right? And that's the great thing about being on the dashboard. Not only is that where everybody spends their time, but also, you know, there's the little widget down there, very unassuming, the little Zebrium widget. But right above, you can, you should be able to tell if you have a problem, right? So there is no there is no sort of false positive noise. Now, it's interesting. When I say, because that gives a, pr a precision of about 20%, 30%, depending on the customer. When I say that to some people, they say, wow, that's really quiet. That's not a lot of noise. You should see all the alerts that we generate, you know. Um, but, you know, to me, it, the real metric is like, would you hook it up to a pager? Um, yeah, I don't know. So hopefully I answered the question. So at this time, I'm seeing one more question. So let's let's see what we can do. Um, so this uh, participant lost connection and just wants to um, get a brief idea on how they can get started with the Zebrium and later how they can be a part of it. Oh, yeah. So uh, just go to our website. Um, it should be on screen. Uh, we offer a 30-day free trial. Um, you just It's really easy to start. If you're cloud native, <clears throat> like if you're running, you know, Kubernetes or whatever, um, the log collectors are, you know, it's a one chart deploy and you're off to the races. Um, you can send us email um, and, uh, you know, if you want to work with us and maybe we need to figure some things out together or you want to just have some ideas for the tech or whatever, you can send us an email or, you know, once you sign up, you're part of our Slack community. So you can just go into the discussion area there um, and, and kick it off. So whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. Yep. Great. Well, I'm, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'm going to give the audience a couple more minutes to go ahead and send any in while I give away some gift cards. Um, so the winner, we've got four winners of our four $25 Amazon gift card drawing. Our first winner is Joan Z. Our second winner is Nelson M. Our third winner is Jesus A. And our fourth and final winner is Daniel P. So to the four of you, congratulations. Keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. But if you don't happen to see that email, please check your spam folder. And I'll also take this opportunity to remind everyone that this session was recorded. So following this webinar, you'll receive an email with a link to access this recording on demand. You can also find the recording living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars. And just be sure to look in the on demand section. All right. So Larry, Gavin, I'm not seeing any more questions at this point. Um, any parting words? Yeah, there's hope. Hopefully there's going to be, you know, more, more tools uh, in the marketplace that try to automate the process of observing. So um, get on board and let us know what you think. Help us make this a reality. Thanks, guys. Well, Larry, Gavin, thank you both so much for joining us today. I'd like to thank Zebrium for sponsoring this webinar. And of course, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you spending time with us. We ask for one extra moment of your time to fill out a brief post-webinar survey that should pop up on your screen. But otherwise, we do hope to see you at an upcoming Tech Strong Learning workshop or webinar. Everyone have a great rest of your day.